This is an example of a Julia set. They are much more than just beautiful images. They are mathematical structures of extreme complexity, and yet the mathematics behind them is quite easy to explain. So this is where we are headed. In this video I'll talk about the complex plane dynamics, and by the end you will understand the simplest Julia set. In the next videos we will talk about different types of Julia sets, and you will understand, in all glory, exactly how these beautiful images are created. Okay, so in my last video I introduced the notion of a complex plane and complex numbers, so if you have not seen that video then perhaps you should do so now. So we have the real axis going this way and the imaginary axis going this way, and this is what we call the complex plane. In it, we have a bunch of complex numbers everywhere. Every complex number has a real component and an imaginary component, and together these two components always identify some complex number in the plane. Now, of course, the plane, the complex plane just by itself, is a very boring place because all you have is just a bunch of uh, complex numbers in it. Um, but everything becomes much more interesting once you introduce the notion of a function. Now, you can think of a function as simply a mathematical rule. A function will always take a point from the complex plane, and it will assign it some other point in the complex plane, based on some mathematical formula. Now, mathematicians will say that the first number gets mapped under this function to a second number. We usually denote function by letter f, which stands for function, I suppose. So basically, every number in the complex plane gets mapped to some other number in the complex plane, and f tells you how this mapping is to be carried out. I will now give you a particular example of a function to help better illustrate the point. So let's take any complex number in the complex plane. Um, I don't know what this is. It looks like 1 plus 3i, let's say. And let's have a function that simply adds 5. So what's 1 plus 3i? Let's add 5 to this. We will get back simply 6 plus 3i. Uh, this point would be 5 units to the right. It would be somewhere here. So this function that simply adds 5 mapped this point into this point. Similarly, it adds, it maps every point in the complex plane, 5 units to the right. Mathematicians would write down that f of z is equal to z plus 5. What this means is that you take any complex number in the complex plane, and you denote it by z, and you map it to z plus 5. In other words, you move a point 5 units to the right. This is a very trivial example of a function. So you can think of functions as rules for how complex numbers should move around the complex plane. Now here comes the most important part. We will be interested in what happens to points in a complex plane when they are repeatedly mapped under the same function. So what I mean is you take any point in a complex plane and you apply some function f to it. Then you take the result and you apply the function again. You take the result, you apply the function again. And you keep doing this for infinity. Now what we are really interested in is the fate of this point as it gets mapped under f many 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 times. So to take our trivial example where f simply added 5, you can see that every point under f will simply move to the right 5 units. And if you do it again it will just move to the right always to the right until infinity. We like to say uh, in mathematics that it escapes to infinity. So, if you take any complex number, then under our trivial function f that just adds 5, every single complex number will simply escape to the infinity. In general, if you study many different kinds of functions, you'll see that points can follow all kinds of interesting paths. Uh, one important example that you already saw is that point simply escapes to infinity. It doesn't have to escape to infinity along a straight line, it can also, for example, spiral out to infinity or do something even crazier. Uh, points can also, you know, spiral in, for example, to the origin. Points can also, you know, be stuck in cycles. Uh, sometimes they can even travel along randomly and then snap into a cycle. They can also, for example, travel along and then suddenly stop, completely stop, and remain in the same place forever. They will just keep mapping to themselves, you know, from now on until infinity. So really, all kinds of interesting things can happen. In particular, however, we will be interested in a very simple sub-problem. Given a point and a function, if you apply this function to the point infinitely many times, does this point escape to infinity, or does it stay what we call bounded? 
So does it escape to infinity or doesn't it escape to infinity, basically? So these two examples escape to infinity, but these examples, for example, cycle or what we call a fixed point or a spiral in or something like that, these all stay bounded. They will not escape to infinity. Okay, so we are now ready to tackle some more interesting problems. Let's study the behavior of all points in a complex plane as they are mapped by function f of z is equal to z squared, or z times z. In other words, the function takes a complex number and it multiplies it by itself. Now, we want to look at the complex plane and identify the points that will escape to infinity under this function and the points that will stay bounded. So let's pick a random point somewhere in the complex plane. Now remember how you multiply complex numbers. You add the angles and you multiply the lengths. Since we only have a single number here when squaring it, this is equivalent to saying that you double the angle and you square the length. So doubling the angle is going to be easy, but those of you that have some background in mathematics will be quick to note that squaring the lengths can potentially yield some interesting behavior. This is due to the fact that the result of squaring depends strongly on whether or not the number is bigger than or smaller than 1. If you square a number that is smaller than 1, such as 0 0.5, then your result is going to be even smaller. 0.25 in this case. But if you take a number that is larger than 1, such as 2, you will get a result that is even larger. 4, for example, in this case. And if you take number 1, then 1 squared is just 1. 1 times 1, 1. So numbers smaller than 1 become smaller, numbers greater than 1 becomes become larger, and 1 just stays the same. But this means that when we apply our function to complex numbers with lengths greater than 1, let's say that this is such a number, the result will have even greater length than what it had before. So the result of such multiplication would be something like that. We double the angle, so we move it you know, in a counterclockwise direction, and we move it further off the origin. But if a number is very small and lower than 1, then such number will not only rotate, but it will also get closer to the origin, so it will get somewhere here. So we'll travel this way, and in fact it will spiral into the origin. Numbers out will spiral away from the origin, and numbers exactly with length 1, so all complex numbers in a circle of radius 1 around the origin, they will just keep traveling around the circle because their length will never change, because 1 squared is just simply 1. So these numbers will simply travel in a circle. We can summarize our findings by a diagram. We will color every complex number that stays bounded as black, and we will color numbers that escape to infinity as blue. Here's the result. You're looking at the complex plane. This is the circle of radius 1. And now as I move the cursor around, these white lines show graphically the fate of the complex number below the cursor. Every single line segment corresponds to one application of our squaring function. So you can see graphically how they move around. They basically, all these numbers inside this big circle spiral in towards the origin, and all the numbers outside of this circle inevitably escape to infinity. If I could only get my mouse cursor exactly at the boundary, you could see that, well, I can't get it exactly there, but the number would basically just go in circles forever. And you will have to take my word for it or the word of mathematics, because I can't show it on this program. But you get the idea. So there you have it. You may be surprised to find out that the diagram I just showed you here is actually an image of the simplest Julius set. You never see this mentioned as a Julius set because it is admittedly quite boring, it's just a big circle. But in the next video you will see that things get very interesting very fast.